This is session one, video clip three of the AEDT 1120 Foundations of Digital Te Teaching and Learning Technologies course from UOIT. The title of this particular video clip is PBL Scenario A, Prinsky and the Concept of Digital Natives. The analysis questions for this video clip are as follows. Number one, why were social reformers like Ryerson interested in setting up universal education systems? Number two, what views of learning underlie traditional educational systems? In other words, what are the definitions of learning that are being used in these systems? Number three, how has the use of education technology changed over the years? And number four, what evidence does Mark Prensky use to support his major claims? The next few slides are intended to be illustrative of the development of educational system within the province of Ontario, Canada. While there may be some similarities with respect to processes and events in other places, it is assumed that these similarities will be highly contextualized to each locality. Prior to the arrival of Edgerton Ryerson, the educational system in mid-19th century Upper Canada, as Ontario was then known, was limited to individuals who had sufficient resources to be able to participate in the few parochial schools that had been established. Education was reserved for those who were part of the upper class as well as those with financial and political means. And as the schools were established by the church, the Church of England in Upper Canada, as well as a small number established by the Roman Catholic Church, the views and curriculum content were controlled in such a way as to ensure that the political and social and religious structure of the day was maintained to a large extent. Edgerton Ryerson was an ardent United Empire loyalist, which means that he was loyal to the British monarchy, and he was also a Methodist circuit rider. Um, essentially, this means that he was an itinerant preacher who rode his horse from one town to the next. These roles represent a contrasting set of values in that the loyalty to the monarchy implies a desire to maintain British military and colonial power, while Methodism in Upper Canada was the seat of a social, religious, cultural, and education revolution. Stories about Ryerson's excursions on the docks in York, now called Toronto, can be found. And some of these uh, go something along these lines. Upon seeing a number of street urchins playing and causing havoc for the dock workers, he expressed a desire to provide opportunities to the young people to acquire useful skills so that they could become gainfully employed members of society. Ryerson was proposing simultaneous changes to the societal norms while seeking to fit these urchins into the societal structures of the day. The quotation from the uh, Canadian Encyclopedia displayed on this slide provides a glimpse into the type of motivation that propelled Edgerton Ryerson and other like-minded individuals. The, these ideals then became the basis for the initial public education system in Ontario. See the History of Education article referenced on the slide. There are some who believe that the aspirations represented by the founders of public education in Ontario may have been well-intentioned, but they also laid the groundwork for the embodiment of the, in quote, spirits of British colonialism, end quote, into the education system in this province. I will quote from an F essay that is self-published by John Williams, 2006. Um, begin quote. Let me note here that cruel treatment of, pe of children, people, was an integral component of methodology, that is, the pedagogy used in the schools, which still haunts us today in classrooms, schoolyard, and principal's office across the nation. Though corporal punishment has almost vanished, the superior attitude of educators remains, as does the atmosphere of disrespect created by school teachers by condescending to children and their families. Children's humanity is sacrificed for teachers' authoritarianism. Here are the seeds of most so, much social distress in Canada, end quote. And that's taken from Williams, 2006, Edgerton Ryerson, the father of education in Ontario, and you can see the link um, as it will be given later on in this video clip.
In the 100 years following the introduction of public education in Ontario, the relative importance of obtaining an education had grown immensely. A story, perhaps fictitious from the outset and more prominent in the United States uh, of America than in Canada, developed about the relationship between a good education and the opportunities for obtaining a good job or career. Families consequently then began to look at education as a means of assuring future financial success for their children. Tied to the financial side of the equation was the promise of greater social scalability, for example, opportunities to become uh, medical doctors or lawyers. Whether the link between education and career still exists, if it ever did, is currently highly contestable. Please be aware that this table is a generalization, perhaps even a stereotype, and it, it's definitely a critique of the situation. It is based to a large extent on my own experiences in the K-12 private and public systems and in higher education systems as well. I won't read through all of the bullets on this slide, but suffice it to say that in traditional systems, knowledge is viewed as a commodity or a set of objects that can be transferred wholesale from teacher to student, regardless of the differences in personality, experiences, and perspectives between the two. Notice the imbalance of control between the teacher and the student. The teacher and the educational system determines the subjects and topics that will be studied. The teacher and the educational system is not only responsible for choosing or imposing the content that will be learned, but the teacher and the educational system also upholds the processes that will be used including the time of year, the time of day, the location of the classes, not to mention the size of the classes, the type and number of tools students may use while studying. Even assessment, ostensibly for the purpose of determining how well an individual student learned, seems to be turned into a mechanism to separate students into the academic haves and have-nots. It is no wonder that there are many students who feel that education is something that is done to them and it has no relevance to the lives that they want to live. It may be appropriate here to view the RSA animation of a talk given by Sir Ken Robinson. I'll include the URL to this animation in the presentation file for this video clip in a later slide. As access to education increased, there is an increasing need to deal with large numbers of students in the classroom and throughout the schooling system. Accordingly, the concepts of curriculum and pedagogical technique were developed. Pedagogy increasingly became a means of transmitting the concepts, generalizations and methods of academic disciplines onto new generations. And this is usually referred to as academic rationalist type of position. This was primarily done through a didactic narrative mode. Um, in order to move beyond a purely tr oral tradition, a new device, actually a larger version of the personal slate that has been in, had been in use for several centuries, the blackboard was pressed into service. This analog, non-digital technology became standard equipment in classrooms until the present day, although variations such as whiteboards and interactive whiteboards, for example smart boards, are currently beginning to replace the original design. Technology is defined here as a device that makes l human life simpler. Accordingly, everything from a stick that is used to scratch symbols in the sand, a board that displays chalk marks, and chalk marks themselves, symbols that are recognized to re uh, represent letters, words, and concepts, as well as the models that is physical or virtual, these are all technologies. Mark Prensky, um, as a contrast to the historical picture drawn over the last past few slides, I'm going to turn in, to an argument that is presented by Mark Prensky. Prensky's views of the drawbacks of the educational system in the USA have been well documented in a number of articles published in the popular press. Electronic copies of two of these articles, Digital Natives and Digital Immigrants, Parts 1 and 2, will be made available to you in the Blackboard portion of this course. Prensky has also published a number of books that flesh out his arguments to a greater extent. As can be seen in the outline of Mr. Prensky's bio given on this slide, Mark has had a varied career with brief stints as a teacher, school administrator, as well as a professional concert musician where he played the lute and classical guitar. He is currently the CEO of a commercial company that creates and markets electronic training games. I invite you to check out more 
uh, out more details uh, included on Mr. Prensky's resume and it's found at the link given on this slide. In the articles that can be found in Blackboard, Prensky categorizes people into two groups, digital natives and digital immigrants. Digital natives are primarily found in the millennial generation or younger, in other words, those who have grown up in the ubiquitous presence of digital technologies, using among other things computers, MP3 players, and cell phones to communicate, work, and play. Prinsky reports that average college grads, remember this is in the United States, um, and these average college grads in 2001 would have been part of the digital native group, spent less than 5,000 hours of their lives um, reading, but over 10,000 hours playing video games, not to mention 20,000 hours, according to Prinsky's uh, figures again, watching television. Digital immigrants, then, are those who were not born with access to digital technologies, but have come to use digital technologies to a greater or lesser extent. Prinsky also claims that, like all immigrants, digital immigrants um, re retain an accent that's identifiable. Um, it identifies their immigrant status. A digital accent can be anything from printing a hard copy version of a paper rather than reading it online, or preferring to use a telephone rather than Skype or texting a friend or a colleague. Based on these definitions then, digital natives and digital immigrants, Prensky proceeds to indict the U.S. educational system, stating that our students have radi changed radically. Today's students are no longer the people our educational system was designed to teach. Over the next week, your task will be to investigate the claims made by Prensky using an individual problem-based approach. The problem then that is set for you is um, to formulate an argument regarding whether Prensky is correct regarding the existence of digital natives and the implications for the educational system in the U.S. and by extension, of course, in Canada. The knowledge and resources that you have available to you well, you should move beyond opinion by gathering backing documentation from the literature. You will need to do some extensive reading of materials referenced through this video clip and then moving further afield by finding your own resources. You should make use of the electronic resources available to you uh, through UOIT's online library and we'll be discussing your findings in next week's tutorial session. Theoretical Perspectives. This slide presents some of the theoretical discussions referenced earlier in this video clip. So for instance, Sir Ken Robinson's RSA animation, a link is given there for that, and the academic rationalist theoretical position is uh, referenced to uh, Erickson 1992, and you can find that in the Journal of Te Technology Education, uh, Volume 3, um, Portion 2, Page 1. And that brings us to the synthesis questions for this video clip, and those synthesis questions are as follows. Number one, why is it useful to study the history of an education system in a discussion of the use of educational technology? For instance, um, in other words, technology that is used to assist education processes. Number two, what roles does culture play in the development of educational systems? Number three, Describe the relationship between educational technology use and the views of learning and, no, and nature of knowledge. In other words, what is knowledge? And number four, according to Prensky, why does the current educational system in the U.S. and presumably in Canada need to change? And that brings us to the end of the synthesis questions for this video clip and the video clip itself.